Hello everyone and welcome to an introduction to feminism. This will probably end up being broken up into three parts. The first part will include what is highlighted in white here, an introduction to feminism itself, the major waves of feminism, and then the readings for this first week. The second lecture will be a deeper dive into Simone de Beauvoir's um, introduction to the second sex, and then the third will include some more in-depth uh, history into the various feminist approaches that have existed in philosophy, as well as some of the potential problems that they've encountered, and then alternatives that we might view. So to get us started, we're looking at part one of our text, which is called What is Feminism? So we're going to start off with some terminology, just to make sure we're all on the same page, because these terms are used a lot in everyday language, either incorrectly or people use them with different background assumptions, and so we want to be clear on how we're going to be using the terms in our class. The first term itself is feminism, so the literal definition it comes from the French, femme, uh, which means woman, and then the ism there refers to a political position. But really, this notion of having it be political is not just in one's ideology, but also in one's actions. And so we're getting a sense not just of what someone believes if they claim to be a feminist, but also what they're willing to do or act upon to make those beliefs come to fruition. Now, although feminism did start as restricted to focus on women, it's important to note that it started off really not capturing the uh, discrimination and oppression and marginalization that faced all women. That's going to be one of the big issues that we look at. Uh, primarily, feminism began really concerned with the interests of middle and upper class white women. And so it took feminism a while to really be inclusive of all women's experiences. And then, as we're going to see, has since evolved to capture an aim for equality that goes beyond just one gender. So feminism, we're going to see it evolve to start to look at different marginalized masculinities. Feminism is then going to move beyond gender itself to look at other views, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So more thoroughly, feminism is both the intellectual commitment and political movement towards ending oppression and achieving equality and respect for all. And because this is sort of a broad definition, and as you can already guess, there are going to be lots of different types of feminism, simply saying that one is a feminist doesn't tell us exactly what one believes or what positions one takes on a certain issue, right? So like any terminology, it ends up being over time more of an umbrella term of which there can be a lot of variety within. And so to be considered a feminist, feminist on the most basic level, you will have to agree with two main claims, but then beyond those claims, again, we're going to see a great uh, amount of variety in these views. And so the first claim that one must commit themselves to, to call themselves a feminist, is a descriptive claim. So by descriptive, we mean a description of the way things are. And you see I have a little footnote here, so please feel free to take a look at um, the, the full-length descriptive claim. But to verbalize it for you, the descriptive claim of feminism is that women and those who appear to be women are discriminated against, right, in that they are treated differently, they are marginalized or oppressed, subjugated, right, whatever verb you want to include there. But they are oppressed because they are or appear to be women, right? So this is not just, you know, what do people like to say, playing the woman card, right? So if someone, you know, just doesn't like you as a person and you happen to be a woman, that doesn't mean that they are discriminating you against you because you're a woman, right? So the idea is that whatever treatment one is receiving, it would count as, right, this violation of one's equality if you're being treated that way because you are or appear to be a woman. Now, again, that was in its more narrow sense, so we could since broaden this descriptive claim to include any other form of identity in which people experience marginalization, right, or oppression, so we could include this, or we could have this include race, physical ability, religious ideology, right, lots of different views. But the basic descriptive claim, again, is that someone is discriminated against because they are or appear to be a woman. 
The second claim that you must agree to if you want to identify as a feminist is called a normative claim, and this is more of an ought, right? So instead of just describing the way things are, as we did with the descriptive claim, the normative claim is setting a standard for how things ought to be. So when you acknowledge that people are treated differently, you must also acknowledge that that mistreatment ought not to occur, right? So in order to be a feminist, you must both agree that there is discrimination and that it ought to be stopped when and where it occurs. Now what this means is that you could not be a feminist by disagreeing with one of these. So for instance, some people might say, oh yes, I'm a feminist. I think that everyone ought to be treated equally. But they would not be considered a feminist if they subscribed to the normative claim but denied the descriptive claim, right? So many people say, oh, gender equality, race inequality, right, whatever it is, we've already overcome this, right? So yes, I think everyone ought to be treated equally, and they already are being treated equally, right? So if you're denying the current reality of that marginalization and discrimination, you cannot consider yourself a feminist. Then there's the more extreme alternative, which often ends up classifying someone uh, really in an anti-feminist position, which is where someone accepts the descriptive claim, right, accepts that there is discrimination, but denies the normative claim, right? They just don't think that people ought to be treated equally, right? So this could be based on some notion of, um, you know, male dominance, right, based in some misunderstanding of uh, evolutionary theory, it could come from uh, the white supremacist culture, right, that we just think there are different classes of people because of different biological or sociological uh, factors that they might have, okay? So again, to consider oneself a feminist, you must adhere to both the descriptive claim and the normative claim, right? So accepting the reality of the way people are actually treated, as well as committing oneself to the fact that it must be changed. Right, so as I mentioned, this has gone beyond simply being concerned with the way women are being treated and, right, has since progressed to include not just gender, right, which is in and of itself a very wide range of categories, but also to include physical ability, right? So feminists have really paved the way to advocate for the, those who might be physically or mentally disabled um, and what it even means to have a disability or to be physically or mentally abled. Also including sexual orientation, right? So in other words, we live in what we might call a heteronormative society where we think the norm, as it were, is to be heterosexual, right? Where we have people attracted to those of the opposite sex, right? So feminism has since included trying to advocate for the equality of members of the LGBTQIA community. Also, as we're going to see right off the bat, this definitely includes race because we have to acknowledge that not all women and not all men have the same experiences, right? So the experiences of white women are going to be very different from the experiences of women of color, black women, indigenous women, and so on. We're also looking at ways in which certain religious groups or uh, orientations tend to be privileged in certain societies. Right, so in the West, we tend to live in what is uh, an Abrahamically dominant tr tradition, right, where those who subscribe to Christianity for foremost, um, but certainly perhaps then Judaism as a secondary and others would be more privileged than say, members of the Muslim community, members of uh, other marginalized or lesser known religious traditions. Similarly with age, right? We're looking at a lot of different variations of ageism where someone could be treated differently because they are perceived as being too young or too old, right? For a certain job or uh, as being capable of cert doing certain things. And what's interesting about feminism is that it has now most contemporarily moved even beyond looking at how humans are treated and is now looking into the parallels between the way we discriminate against certain species of animals and the environment itself and historically the way women and other marginalized groups have been treated. So for example, um, a lot of feminists have done work talking about the way that, you know, various arguments for eating meat are very close to the arguments that were used to justify the oppression of women, right, 
and especially uh, black Americans, right, if we're looking at the Western culture, right? So arguments about them being inherently inferior, right? Arguments that involve um, the notion that they are somehow more of an object, right, than a subject. And so their bodies are somehow um, owned or rightfully restrained in certain ways by, in this case, men, right, or humanity. And again, to the environment. Um, I mean, I think the most prevalent example of this right now is looking at um, all of the various disasters, right? Uh, natural disasters that have been happening that have been escalating due to climate change. You might notice that we talk about nature as if it were feminine, but we also tend to objectify it in the same way. So when you hear about, you know, the history of you know, uh, so-called discovering new lands, you'll often hear the, the land itself being described in the same way a man might describe a woman's body, right? Something to be explored and uncovered, um, something that is, um, you know, se has secrets, right? <laughs> that the explorer is somehow meant to unfold. And again, going back to our current climate, you might notice that all of the, uh, although we're running out of alphabet letters for the various um, storms, you might notice that they all are named after women, right? They're given feminine names. And so this idea that somehow women and nature are very closely connected in their chaos, right? In the fact that they are temperamental and uncontrollable. So this is just to give you a sense of, again, the wide variety of feminism that we're going to see in this class and that you'll come across in the world. Again, it does not mean only one thing. It started off more historically as too narrow a political position, right? And has since been making efforts over history and t uh, still to this day to try to become more and more inclusive. And so we can think of feminism in this way as being aspirational, right? Moving towards, right? Ending the oppression and achieving equality and respect for all. Now, again, I wanna emphasize this because many of the misconceptions of feminism tend to think that uh, the existing inequalities might just want to be switched, right? So if we currently live in a society in which some groups are dominant over others, right? In our case, we live in patriarchal societies, which means that we have a hierarchy, much like this uh, triangle you can see here, where there are going, there's going to be power concentrated at the top with very few people in charge. And the majority of people are going to be at the bottom and with the least amount of power. And so a patriarchy refers to this system being male dominant, meaning that the higher up you go in the hierarchy, the fewer women there will be. If we go back in history, right, there will be no women at the top, right? But very few, if any, and the idea is that those individuals at the top, right, again, have the power to make decisions for those at the bottom. Now, the idea here again is that feminism is not simply trying to switch this hierarchy, right? We're not trying to say that, you know, since women or people of color have been oppressed, we need to put them at the top and start oppressing men or oppressing white people, right? That is not the idea. The idea is that we are correcting for an inequality that has been in existence. Right? And so in this sense, we want to get a, maybe a broader understanding of what patriarchies do in terms of things like what we have up next, sexism, and then also misogyny. So sexism has traditionally been understood as discrimination based on one's sex. And by sex here, again, we want to be clear, what we mean is your biological sex. And historically, People in the West, uh, predominantly in uh, Eurocentric Western traditions, have ascribed to what we call a sex binary, meaning that there, it is believed that there are only two biological sexes, that is male or female. But as uh, you will learn, if, if you are not already aware, there are not only two biological sexes that occur in nature, right? There are what we have uh, historically termed um, intersex, or uh, prior to that, um, were known uh, under other terms which have since gone out of use, right? So we're, we can use the term intersex here to refer to what we might call a third sex, right? Of which there is still a great variety of the various combinations that occur. We'll get into that later. But the idea is that sexism has assumed, right? That there are only two sexes and 
that one of them is discriminating against the other. So when you have a sexism which is male dominant, right, where predominantly men, again, I'm, we're making generalizations here, there are always gonna be exceptions, but predominantly men have been dominant over women, that is called misogyny. The other view, the flip side, is known as misandry. Now what's interesting is that misandry and misogyny are not entirely opposites because misogyny, as you'll see when you uh, read this, the intro from Simone de Beauvoir, misogyny has always existed, right? There has never been a time when women were dominant over men. So misogyny is something that has always existed where misandry is something that might emerge simply as a response to misogyny, right? And so they're, they're not exactly opposites in that sense. But if we're understanding what the terms mean, right, we can understand misogyny as a discrimination against women or misandry as a discrimination against men. But again, we might want to elaborate on a more deeper understanding of these terms, because if we understand sexism or misogyny simply as a hatred or discrimination of someone based on one's sex, that allows a lot of individuals to say that they're not sexist or not misogynist if they don't discriminate against all people of a certain sex, right? So you'll often hear people say, oh, I'm not a misogynist or I'm not a sexist because, you know, I have these women in my life that I love, right? I, I love my mother, I love my wife, I love my sister, right? So they'll, they'll list individuals or certain exceptions, right? to that sort of discrimination. And so a better understanding of these terms comes from a contemporary philosopher named Kate Mann, who I've cited in the notes below. And she defines sexism and misogyny as two sides of the same coin, neither of which can be generalized to all of one's beliefs or all of one's actions. So in this sense, she understands sexism to be the ideology, right? The beliefs that tend to justify or support male dominant social relations, right? So in this sense, right, someone could treat women well, but still be sexist if they believe, right, that anywhere in which men are dominant over women, that that is justified, right? Or when they are uh, confronted with a criticism of male domination, they would defend that existing inequality, right? So again, this more contemporary understanding of sexism allows for the complexity of human belief, right? In that, you know, not all of our beliefs are gonna embody various forms of discrimination or biases that we have. Similarly, with misogyny, she's going to understand this not so much as just a discrimination against women because they are women, but instead as a way of policing those women who challenge the status quo, in this case, a patriarchal system of male dominance. So one is a misogynist or can act misogynistically only if they control or punish women who challenge male dominance, right? So you might often hear, you know, men talk about their support, right, of women or their, you know, their advocacy of gender equality. But if there is a woman who challenges their authority, if there is a woman who tries to occupy what has historically been a, a male's position of power, say perhaps the presidency, right, regardless of who that woman might be, the reactions to that, right, are going to be misogynistic because they're going to try to defend, right, that status quo the way things have always been, right? So we're going to see lots of examples of this throughout the class, but I want to urge you to start thinking about examples that maybe you've experienced in your own life, right? Times in which you have acted maybe outside of what has typically been understood to be uh, normal for whatever gender you identify as, right? So if you identify as more masculine, if you identify as more feminine, if you identify as being um, outside of the gender binary, right? If you get pushback, right, by violating those norms, right? So if you're a woman who occupies a job, right, in a discipline that has traditionally been ma masculine, right? If you get pushback on that, right? It doesn't really matter 
what those individuals believe, it's the pushback itself that would qualify as misogyny. And there's an added benefit to this contemporary definition because when we're defining terms based on what other people believe, that's really difficult to prove because we don't have access to other people's beliefs, right? We can only speculate so much. And so this term carries a lot of weight to it and we want to be able to use it. And so by changing the definition to ascribe to actions, right, that can help us uh, better use that term in a way that people can't weasel out of. Um, another example uh, that comes to mind is perhaps, I'm sure many of you are painfully aware of the increase of uh, not just mass shootings, but mass shootings perpetuated by what happens to be young white men. And a lot of them, right, we would want to say are misogynists, right, in that they targeted women as their victims. But you'll see a lot of people defend those shooters saying, well, they're not misogynists because they also killed men, right? So again, this other definition allows us to classify these shootings as misogynistic, even though their victims were not just women, right? Misogyny can also come in the form of, again, like we're talking about earlier with different forms of feminism, targeting marginalized groups of men or men that are seen as threatening, right? to one's traditionally masculine persona. All right. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be understanding the term sex in this class as to refer to the biological fact of being male, female, or intersex, right? And so it's really important to understand how we classify in science someone as being male, female, or intersex. So traditionally, these are done on a variety of factors, not just one's uh, predominant hormones, but also your chromosomes, right? So if we have the traditional XX versus XY, but it's important to note that those are not the only chromosomal makeups that are possible, right? There are a lot of individuals who have uh, three chromosomes where the third one could be not just X or Y, but also O right, which is known as Turner syndrome. So there are lots of different variations in nature, right, that we don't learn about, right? They're sort of hidden or obscured in our education to reinforce this idea that there are only two biological sexes that exist. So again, not only is that just false when it comes to biology, right, but it also doesn't account for the broad range of factors that go into defining someone's sex. So into, in addition to hormones and chromosomes, we also would identify sex based on your internal and external genitalia, right? And so this is where we enter into a term known as intersex, which has, again, evolved from other terms which are now outdated. But the idea is that an intersex individual is someone who has some combination of internal and external genitalia that does not align with what we would consider to be male or female, right? So this could be someone who, uh, again, the outdated term would have been uh, hermaphrodite, right? Someone who is perhaps born with two sets of external genitalia. It could also be uh, some of the other outdated terms are uh, merms and firms, right? These are the difference between having, say, internal testes and an external vagina, right? Or an external penis and internal ovaries, right? So there are lots of different combinations here. And these occur naturally in much higher numbers than any of us realize. Again, because when they do occur, because they have occurred within a system which assumes a binary, they're often treated as medical emergencies and doctors would often advise parents to make a decision right after an infant is born to have a quote unquote sex change or corrective surgery and then they would have to decide whether or not that individual was going to be raised as male or female. And you can imagine the sort of trauma and confusion that this would lead to as these intersex children grow up, right? Many times they're, they weren't even informed that they were born intersex, right? And so having that choice being made for them by someone else, um, you know, doesn't always align with uh, someone's own sense of their sexual identity. And then to further complicate the issue again is the fact that they were treated as medical emergencies, which they are not. Being born intersex is not in and of itself uh, problematic to one's health. And 
can in fact, the, the surgeries themselves can cause a lot of problems for those individuals later on, right? And what's worse is that in all three of these cases, male, female, or intersex, even though there's a set, a complex set of factors that go into being classified as one of these, doctors don't actually apply or look at all of that information when naming the sex, right? So if any of you have children or know of anyone who's had children, you know that these are typically only labels that are given based on one's external genitalia. And so there have been some interesting cases where someone has presented as female, right, and has been raised their whole life as a, as a female and, um, you know, identified later on as a woman. And they were then tested and found out that they had a third chromosome. In this case, it was a Y chromosome. And then they were just, they were disqualified from participating in the women's Olympics, right? Because they were technically, right? Quote unquote, technically not a female in that way. So again, the important thing to understand is that these are culturally defined. There are differences depending on which cultures we're in and they've changed over time. So in some cultures, there is a third sex, right, or a third gender that is ascribed, but we have been raised in a binary where we've assumed there are only two types of biological sex, male or female, and we have assumed that they are opposites of one another, which we'll talk about later as well. So gender, on the other hand, is a cultural idea of being masculine or feminine, both or neither, and again, to varying degrees. So one of the things that we're going to look at is how sex and gender have been viewed throughout history as either being uh, connected together in a one-to-one -one relationship or in the more extreme cases, and as we're starting to progress towards now, seeing these as being entirely different, right? So the traditional view is that if you are born a male, then you would identify as masculine, and then your sexual identity or gender identity later on right, would be to be um, attracted to someone of the opposite sex, right, whereas someone who thinks that, right, or who identifies as a female, right, the, we assume that they will identify as being a woman, right, being feminine, and then that they will be attracted to men. But as we know, these are not a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Someone can be born biologically male, they might identify as being more feminine, they might not identify as belonging to either of those groups, and they could be attracted to any number of individuals. All right, so I've included a little link here with a map to some other terms. There are lots of different terms um, that one could use to define one's sex, gender, gender identity, or even now sexual orientation. So I encourage you to take a look at these. I think the important lesson to understand is not just how these terms have evolved over time, but the importance of allowing individuals to be able to identify themselves, right? Instead of us trying to ascribe an idea or a label to them. And in order to help us understand this, you know, I'm not trying to say that like we can be whatever we want, but I think it's important to understand because anytime you put a solid concrete definition to one of these labels, you're inherently going to be excluding people from counting as that, right? So if we were to think that there were only two types of sex, right, males and females, and that there were only two types of genders, right, masculine, feminine, and so all males are masculine and identify as men, all females are feminine and identify as women, I would encourage you to see if even you identify as what we would call cisgendered, right, and that you align in these ways, do you even see yourself as having all of the masculine traits, right, that we assign to quote unquote men? If you identify as a woman, do you have all of the feminine traits that we ascribe to quote unquote women, right? So you might consider even making a list, right? So on one hand, put man, list all of the words that in your society we associate with being a man, being masculine, being male, and do the same for feminine, right, for females. See if you think, right, being a woman, right, means all these things. Then, after you make that list, I would encourage you to go through both lists and circle which characteristics apply to you. And I can guarantee you that you will have characteristics from both lists. Now, that doesn't mean that you are confused about your gender identity. It just highlights a problem with the terms themselves, right, that they're always going to exclude 
individuals who fall outside of it, and worse, they're going to misrepresent the people who fall inside of those labels, right? So we will start making assumptions about what people are like once they adopt certain labels. So take a look at these and explore them for yourselves. All right. So the one of the first readings that I had for you for this week was um, a graphic guide, an introduction to feminism, which I thought was hopefully a little bit of a more fun way to get this history. And so this is pretty simple, right? An overview of the three waves. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few things. So I'll go through this PowerPoint a little quickly, but please feel free to pause, come back to this and look at it more in depth on your own. So again, right, we're understanding feminism as this aim of ending right, an oppression or discrimination that has been occurring. And this uh, graphic guide covers some of the earlier perspectives on women, both of which have come under large scrutiny, right? So it's not like we've just moved from one view to the other and we're done, right? These are constantly evolving views of which, again, I will go into more of them um, in probably a, a later uh, subsequent lecture. And just know that for my PowerPoints, uh, as a shorthand, I will often use a capital W to refer to women and a capital M to refer to men. Again, that's just my shorthand um, as we go through. So to summarize um, some of the preliminary views covered in this graphic guide, we have the rationalist and individualist perspectives. So the rationalist perspectives is seen as the older view, right, that tends to have emerged when we had pretty much all men, right, working in the field of philosophy and working in really any field that was seen as authoritative on knowledge. And the basic unit under a rational perspective was, like I mentioned before, and unfortunately what is still um, often accepted as a heteronormative unit, right? So under the rationalist perspective, the assumption is that everyone is heterosexual, right, and that every couple, right, will be composed of one man, one woman, or one male and one female. And the idea, again, is that when one ascribes to this binary, it's assumed that thus they each have different characteristics, right, and so make unique contributions to that couple. Unfortunately, though, as we're going to see, since men are assumed to be the norm, not just in the rationalist perspective, but in a patriarchal society writ large, women are only going to be defined under this perspective by their differences, right? And again, even though we've somewhat moved past this rationalist perspective, it's still highly dominant in our language. So that's another term um, that you might want to learn is androcentric or male-centered, right? So in this case, we have very androcentric language, meaning that we often use the word men to apply to everyone, right, or man. So we have phrases like mankind, right, that are meant to refer to everyone. No one would ever accept womankind as referring to everyone. Similarly, if, um, you know, we're talking about, again, people in authority figures, whether it be police officers, doctors, lawyers, right, whoever it is, oftentimes if that individual is a woman, we feel the need to qualify it, saying I have a woman doctor or a female lawyer or something like this, because whether subconsciously or consciously, we are aware that if we don't add that they're a woman, right, people are going to assume that they're a man, right? And so this we're going to see traces back through a long history, right, in higher education, right, and in academia and literature, right, how this androcentric language has evolved and how we still use it today. So even though that view in feminism has sort of switched over, right, it's switched over to a view that is still problematic, and that is the individualist perspective. Now, originally, right, focusing on the individual person seemed like a great response to the rationalists because, well, instead of just viewing, you know, women as part of a heterosexual couple, we can focus on them as themselves. And instead of thinking that, you know, each one is responsible for making, again, contributions to that couple, we can focus on each of them fulfilling their own personal goals. But the problem with the individualist perspective is that it tends to obscure the role that society plays in not only allowing individuals certain opportunities, but also presenting barriers, right, to some individuals getting those opportunities. So 
perhaps you've heard this phrase, you know, like someone pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. This is sort of like the feminist equivalent of that, right? Thinking that, well, women, you can overcome, you know, the sexism from the rationalist perspective by just focusing on the individual. But the idea, again, is that that obscures many of the barriers that are in place to predominantly women of color, right? Or women of different socioeconomic statuses. Right? And so the idea is that even the individualist switch, right, moving to focus on the individual, didn't capture or deal with all of the problems. Right? And so we are still going to need, again, more evolution on the part of feminism. But they did see, at least in the individualist perspective, social roles as not being defined by gender. Right? So the idea is that under the individualist perspective, women should be able to pursue um, you know, occupations, hobbies, activities that might not have been deemed uh, feminine or women's work throughout time, right? But again, these opportunities are going to be more available to some women than others, primarily white women. All right, so looking at the first wave of feminism, again, it's important to note that this sort of constitutes the more narrow and uh, most problematic conception of feminism, where it was really focused on the struggles of the white middle class um, and predominantly single women, that is women who chose never to get married or women who were divorced. And we might think now that, um, you know, women had have a lot of maybe uh, unfair advantages in the legal system. That is an entirely new phenomenon. So women were only allowed to have custody of their children. Um, a couple decades ago because they weren't allowed to have property before then. And it didn't make sense to grant a mother custody of her children if she didn't have any means of taking care of them. Additionally, uh, women were only allowed to start opening uh, credit cards without a male cosigner, I think in like the 1970s, right? So a lot of these things might seem like they were a long time ago, but really have not changed much uh, in the last 50 years. So. Right? The primary focus of the first wave of feminism was achieving women's right to vote, or what is known as women's suffrage, of which if you know anything about the Constitution, right, it is the 19th Amendment, which was um, passed in 1920. But again, focusing on the systematic and structural problems, this did not only not get ratified in all the states right away, right, it took many, many decades, but since has been further complicated by um, uh, uh, voter ID laws and other types of things that have restricted specifically uh, women of color and their access to the vote, right? And then it was even later for indigenous women. So just know that not all women received the right to vote in 1920, even though that's when the 19th Amendment was passed. But this, of course, pushes against, pushed against a status quo, and so started to develop what we now associate as some of the common criticisms of feminism, right? So the idea is, well, if women want the right to vote, they want to be involved in politics, which means they want to move out of the domestic sphere into the public sphere to start working, which means that they're not going to be good mothers, right? Or they don't want to be mothers if they want to go into the workforce. And since it was seen as threatening that family unit, that heterosexual family unit, it was also seen as threatening the moral social order, right? So the idea is the family unit is where we learn how to be good people. And if that's getting disrupted by women going into the workforce, then we're going to have people, you know, young children being raised in this immoral environment and then becoming, uh, you know, chaotic citizens, right? They're not going to, um, you know, contribute in a productive way. Along these same lines, right, the idea that being a feminist, wanting to go out into the workforce, again, this negative idea that that means people don't want to be mothers, means that maybe they don't want to be women at all. Maybe they want to be men, or maybe they want to, you know, occupy a masculine role, meaning that they're probably attracted to women, right? So you can see how the slippery slope of really nonsense, right, cascades into the idea that all feminists are lesbians, right, and they all hate men, and they're just these terrible people right, who hate children and all these other things. Of course, of which we know all of this is false, but has been deeply ingrained in our society. And I still hear a lot of people describe feminists on TV in these same terms, 
or a lot of people who actually hold feminist ideals say, well, I'm not a feminist because I'm not these other things, right? So even though they ascribe to feminist ideology, they believe that being a feminist has all these negative attributions and so don't even want to adopt the label. All right, so there are a lot of other movements going on at the time of which feminism overlapped, right? Not always, but in some cases. Um, this included the abolition of slavery, uh, the temperance movement. In particular, feminists were very much for prohibition. This had to do with the fact that many women um, who, right, the norm at the time was a heterosexual relationship, were dealing with the fact that their husbands would come home inebriated and would engage in aspects of um, intimate partner or domestic violence, right? And so the idea was that women saw alcohol as the fuel to the level of violence that they experienced at home and so sought prohibition as a form of protection for themselves. We also see this going along at the same times as the Enlightenment and socialism or Marxism, which we'll talk more about um, a little bit later. So just know that even though we identify this wave as the first wave of feminism, the term itself didn't come into existence until the end of the wave. And so no one in this group would have identified themselves as a quote unquote feminist, right? And what's interesting is that despite some of the negative stereotypes about feminists at this time, is that they actually did think that women had this sort of innate moral superiority, not in the sense that male men are inferior, to them, but the idea is that they have something to add. They have a perspective, right, that is different from men. And so by bringing that perspective out into the public in the form of voting, right, that they could actually have a greater impact on making society better. Additionally, along with the vote, they were aiming to get women equal access to education, right? So women were not permitted into higher um, institutions of ed education at this time. They were not permitted in certain types of employment. Again, this is white women. Of course, we know that women of color have been engaged in unpaid right, labor for much longer than, sh than we want to even right, accept. Um, and also, again, marriage laws. So not just, again, having the ability to get a divorce, but what it would mean as far as custody and property and even having a legal identity, right? So a lot of times women were seen as part of the property, right, of their husbands. And this goes back to the, you know, the beginnings of the institutions of marriage. Marriage has not historically been about love, but it has been about property. So what is important to know about the first wave of feminism? Well, it unfortunately stopped before they were able to achieve women's suffrage, and that had to do with a redirection of focus towards the efforts of World War I. All right, so the second wave of feminism picks up much later, right? So now we're into the late 20th century, and this is seen as, or uh, sort of captured by the phrase, the personal is the political. Right, so the idea is that instead of just working on getting women's access into the public sphere through the right to vote or legal status, we need to acknowledge that all aspects of women's experiences, both out in the world and at home, should be under scrutiny, right? And so this is when feminism started to expand their consideration beyond just, right, the idea of focusing on upper middle class white women, but focusing on a more racially and socially diverse set of women who are both single and married, right? So this is when we started to acknowledge, unfortunately very late, that not all women have the same experiences, right? So feminism needs to be advocating for the various types of experiences of women, right? And this was going on again at a time when other things were being brought into the limelight, like the protests against the Vietnam War, the um, civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the sort of anti-capitalist um, notion, of, you know, sort of rejecting commercialized standards of beauty, and also, again, perpetuating not just women's access to education, but what types of fields of study were emerging, right, in those fields. And so this is when we start to see the development of women's studies in academia. And again, right, so somewhat trying to unify these diverse and disparate voices within the feminist discourse, right? So even though we're acknowledging that women have different experiences, 
right, and that a number of men, right, in this case with the civil rights movement, black men, and in the case of the gay rights movement, gay men, that these individuals are similarly experiencing oppression and marginalization, and so we need to come together, right, to try to work towards uh, common ends. Some of the other goals, again, were not just access to education employment, but to end discrimination in those arenas, right? So these are things that we're still fighting against today, right? Who has opportunities to certain types of jobs? What sort of pay individuals receive once they end up in those workplaces, right? There are some disturbing studies um, about how difficult it is for women and people of color to get not only a position, but a raise in that position. I mean, there are studies about how it's easier even for you to get a bank loan, like if you're tall and good looking and male, right? So there, it's just, there, these things run really deep and affect all levels. Again, focusing on the personal, right? Trying to end domestic violence. This is something that is still um, a huge battle today, right? And even more so during the pandemic when a lot of people um, have been quarantined at home. And unfortunately, it wasn't until a few years ago that we even started addressing some laws that were still on the books. Like, I can't remember which state it was, but there was a law that, you know, it didn't count as abuse if you punched your wife or something like this. Um, and I think it was like something along the lines of the, the laws that we have that distinguish between child abuse and not, right? So if it's like an open-handed palm, then it doesn't count as abuse, but if it's a fist, it does. So, right, all of these very odd sorts of laws, and of course, um, one of the, the most, you know, unfortunate one is that the notion of a sexual assault or rape within a marriage didn't even exist as a concept until the second wave of feminism, because it was believed that if you married someone, you gave them infinite consent, right? And so there was no way to address these forms of domestic violence, even if they were brought forward. Additionally, right, inadequacy with family support, providing daycare, right, for working parents, also addressing women's reproductive rights, something we are still fighting against today, right, trying to make sure that uh, women have control over their bodies, not just for family planning, but also to make decisions about their own reproduction, right? And so this is in terms of abortion, where we have the um, pro-choice movement as opposed to the anti-choice movement. And uh, that's something that, again, we want, we'll want to get into as the course goes on. Some of the achievements that the second wave of feminism made was the Violence Against Women Act and the excuse me, adoption of at least allowing oral contraception, right, to be uh, purchased over the counter. But this uh, second wave of feminism was halted when in the 1980s we started to see a large number of women enter the workforce because some of those employment opportunities were becoming more available, it tended to override some of the other issues that still needed to be addressed. The third wave of feminism is something that is somewhat debated about whether we're still in it today. I, I don't think we are. I think feminism today looks very different from this, but um, could perhaps be related or a subsection in that it is more about looking beyond just what's happening to women in your own nation, right? So looking at what's happening to women all over the planet, right? So a more global or transversal or transnational approach to gender uh, and women and people's equality, right? So seeing women not just as those who are in need of help, right, for some, from some ally or outside source, but seeing them as agents themselves, right? Uh, individuals who are capable of, again, lifting and empowering themselves. So the idea is not just, right, sort of teach a person to, f or, you know, give a person a fish, but teaching them to fish, right? Making sure that they can empower themselves uh, long after. And this involves, again, redefining feminism, making it more inclusive, more intersectional, meaning that, again, we're acknowledging not just that women have different experiences, but that there is a whole host of different aspects of your identity that can intersect to create really unique types of experiences, right? And perhaps that no two individuals have the same experiences because we are all different in some ways. Some of the negative responses to this is that, you know, one of the potential downfalls of trying to be so inclusive is that your message can become obscured, right? So there ends up being a lack of cohesion. I mean, this came up, you know, in uh, 
2016 during the Women's March, where you had, again, these sort of traditional white feminists saying, like, you know, let's set race aside and just focus on, you know, the fact that we're women and we need to fight for gender equality. And, you know, there's a really big blind spot in that, you know, women of color, black women, they cannot set their race aside. That is a privilege that they do not have, right? And so, you know, being able to acknowledge and advocate for, right, and empower all this diversity while still having a unified message can be very difficult. And because of this, right, it came, uh, there came to object to the notion of it being a wave, right, that, you know, sort of like picks everybody up and everyone's moving in the same direction, when really there are a lot of disparate movements going on. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this form of feminism, though, is that they started to re-embrace the notion of femininity. So something that we'll see is that earlier forms of femininity became very hostile to traditional ideas of what it meant to be a woman, right, because they thought it was on that basis that women were being discriminated against. But, you know, that leads to the criticism that feminists just want to be men. And so we start to see in this third wave of feminism, again, a re-embracing of what it means to be feminine and, you know, the idea of girl power and that sort of thing, which, again, I think we might still be seeing uh, some, some newer contemporary variations of that. Some of the other uh, movements that were uh, being addressed or starting to gain attention during this time was the notion of trafficking, right? Um, not just for uh, workers, but specifically sex workers. Also, um, you know, the fact that we're still dealing in the 1990s and still today with a lot of racial discrimination, discrimination of people based on social, cl social class, and then moving beyond just lesbian and gay rights and starting to address the transgender community. So transgender, um, for those of you who are not aware, right, is someone who identifies as something other than, right, the biological sex that they were born as or that they were labeled as, as an infant, right? And um, this has sometimes people uh, like to use this word, other times they don't, um, because by acknowledging oneself as uh, transsexual or something like this, you're sort of giving other people information about your sexual genitalia that they are not necessarily entitled to, right? So transgender, um, or again, intersex might be the more pref preferred words, right? Some people might not want to use the label trans at all. They might just want to ascribe to the gender that they identify as, right? And so we'll get into some of those. But the idea is that, again, we have newer labels constantly evolving. And this brought up some interesting issues for feminism specifically in regards to body modification, right? So feminists historically were very much against body modification because the idea was that women would be put under pressure to modify their bodies to, uh, you know, appeal to a masculine notion of beauty, right? Or a notion of beauty that was very objectifying, right? Dehumanizing, demeaning in some way. But the transgender rights movement has really highlighted the importance of being able to have control over one's body and even the way your body looks, right? And how having selective surgery, right, can actually be a form of empowerment, right, and can help to subverse the patriarchy, right, by choosing to have the body that you identify with, right? And so this brought up a lot of interesting debates in feminism that are still going on today. Um, again, so promoting a more transnational type of activism, trying to, as I mentioned before, reclaim terms that were once considered derogatory, and also trying to continue to address uh, the androcentric language and advocate for more non-sexist language. Some of the other goals that were still being worked on was, again, regarding education and employment, you know, talking about breaking the glass ceiling, although, again, we also have to talk about the fact that Many women could, you know, if we're working with the ceiling metaphor, are in what we might call the basement, right? And so we need to lift people up. Uh, getting maternity leave, right? Now that's moved into uh, parental leave, again, being more inclusive, acknowledging that not just women or females are parents. Respecting, right? And perhaps, um, you know, finding some way to compensate Parents who work at home, that's going to be an interesting view that we look at when we get to the views of liberation at the end of the course. And again, continuing um, efforts to address violence against women, violence against 
Uh, racial minorities, violence against trans communities, right, we're still battling on these fronts. Similarly, with family support in the form of providing state-funded support, right, for individuals who were not provided with family planning, right, resources, but then are expected to be able to care for the children once they have them, right? So the idea is that we often encounter a lot of um, hypocrisy in these views, right? Is that people seem very concerned with, you know, making sure that women have children regardless of the circumstances, yet those same individuals feel like it is not the state's place to support those children once they exist. And then ironically, we get into the fact that these people are also very much in favor of the death penalty. So we have to make sure that when we're looking at these views, we're looking at consistency, right, throughout the connected issues, as well as the issue itself. And moving on from just the notion of sex work and sex trafficking, is the sexualization and pornification of the media. This is taking on more elaborate uh, forms today. I uh, Perhaps some of you have heard of the um, movie on Netflix that is getting a lot of criticism. I think it's called Cuties. Um, I haven't watched it myself. I don't want to contribute um, to a film that sexualizes underage girls, right? So uh, along with the pornification of the media, right, highly sexualizing women is the adultification and sexualization of minors, right? So we have this um, trend primarily in the West, but you can find examples of it all over the world where, you know, we encourage young women, young girls to make themselves look older and more sexually appealing, right? But then of course, the flip side of that is that we shame them, right? Uh, slut shaming or whatever it is, right? If they get too much of that male attention. And then of course, older women, right? It has the reverse effect where we want them to look younger. Right, and so this is there's a lot that comes out of this pornification of the media, but if you want a simple example, you could probably look at any of the um, what is it, Carl's Jr. ads, where it's like a woman rolling around on a muscle car in a bikini, you know, eating a burger in this highly sexualized way, and that is somehow now being mixed in with nationalism and patriotism as well. Um, there's uh, one commercial where you know, there's fighter jets and the national anthem playing and the American flag. And so all these things end up being wrapped up together in this sort of American identity. But at its center, right, is again, this highly sexualized depiction of the female form. And so some of the achievements of third wave are the promoting of femininity, right, not making it so that women have to be masculine in order to be respected. Although again, that's still a battle that many women deal with and in trying to occupy traditionally male-dominated positions. All right, so now we're gonna talk about Mary Wollstonecraft, um, which is our next reading, and this comes from A Vindication of the Rights of Women. So Wollstonecraft was an English writer, philosopher, and advocate of women's rights, and what she wanted to address was really the damage done to women because of their dependence on men and because of their exclusion from the public, right? So the idea is that if we look at this traditional notion of masculinity, that women are meant to be homemakers, they're meant to be mothers, they're not meant to be politically engaged, they're not meant to be educated, right? They're meant to exist in this, you know, domestic sphere almost purely for the purpose of other men, right? She wants to address that, but it's also important to note that she was not advocating for full political equality in the way that we might think of a feminist, right? So she might not be considered of a feminist because she did not think that women should have equal access to education. She thought they should receive just enough education to make themselves better wives, better mothers, and better citizens. So again, this is a very early form of white feminism, if we want to call it feminism at all, right? In the sense that it is advocating for a very, very narrow sort of expansion on women's rights. So who are her targets in this paper? So she is addressing some highly uh, respected men in various fields of academia, um, in psychology as well at the time. So Charles Talligrand Perigold, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
and Dr. John Gregory, right? So she's addressing each of these views, which again, were very, um, very highly respected and accepted at the time. And what she's advocating for is the idea that, you know, men have all these problems with women, right? There are all these criticisms of women as being sort of silly and frivolous and interested in things that aren't important and only interested in their looks. And they want to then use those criticisms to say that women don't have a place in society. They shouldn't receive an education. They shouldn't be involved in politics because they have these qualities. And what she's going to be arguing for is to say that the reason they have these qualities is because you didn't give them a proper education, because you didn't allow them to pursue avenues of intellectual pursuit that were more serious, right? And so she thinks, right, that when you when you teach women to be subordinate, right, to be subservient to men, right, or other people who are in a higher position than them, and when you encourage young women to focus on their beauty and their looks over their minds, of course they're not going to be considered rational people, right? So she's acknowledging this sort of vicious circle that men have created for women where you have put them in a position where they can only be this type of thing and then you criticize them for being that type of thing. And she uses a lot of arguments by analogy in this paper. The first one is by comparing women to flowers, right? An analogy that is still often used. And the idea here is that when we make these kind of comparisons, what we're communicating is that just like with flowers, their beauty is going to be more important or worth more than their strength, right? Or their usefulness, right? Flowers are not seen as having any sort of use other than aesthetically pleasing, right? To, to please one to look at it, right? And the idea is that the flower doesn't look at itself, right? The flower is being looked at by someone else. And so we might call this the male gaze, right? And so when we compare women to flowers in this way, we're telling them that you shouldn't try to be strong, right? You should try to be fragile and dainty like the flower. And your only usefulness is to be beautiful, right? For someone to look at. But what we want to acknowledge is the fact that beauty is something temporary, right? Whether it's in a flower or a person, beauty fades, whereas strength she considers more as a personal virtue and is something that not only persists over time, but can be built up more and more as time goes on. So what are the sorts of ideas that she, you know, is dealing with at the time of her writing? Well, the common notion in a patriarchy that men are superior and that women are inferior, right? And that women, she thinks, have been lowered even more than nature dictates. So she's almost sort of acknowledging here that there is some natural differences between men and women, but that the way women have been situated in society is even lower than what their nature would demand, right? So they're treated as weaker than they actually are. They're treated as more fragile than they actually are. They're treated as less rational than they actually are. Again, the focus here is on middle-class white women who she wanted to focus on primarily as being uncorrupted by the other extremes, right? So she saw the um, extreme wealth as being something that could corrupt virtue and extreme poverty, not in the sense that you can't be virtue, virtuous when you're impoverished, but in the idea that you're more concerned with maintaining your basic survival needs, right? And so cultivating uh, virtue is not gonna be your priority. So by virtue here, we're talking about your sense of character, and she, she's gonna talk about virtues of the mind, virtues of the body, and then she's gonna talk about virtues that have been ascribed to men and to women respectively. So intellectual virtues she thinks of the mind are something that we can only gain through an education right so if you deny women an education you can't expect them to have intellectual virtues similarly with the body right strength only comes through exercise so we can't criticize women for not having strong bodies when we prohibit them from engaging in the kinds of activities that would develop that strength Masculine virtues at her time are understood to be respect and rationality, right? Which we think are things that are necessary to develop character. Whereas feminine virtues are considered to be more about elegance and sensibility. So sensibility here is about having the right emotional temperament. We're gonna see that a lot where men are expected to have rational minds and women are meant to control their bodies and their emotions. 
But because women are perceived to be less virtuous in this respect, they're going to be seen as weaker virtuously. So these feminine virtues in more detail include the delicacy of the body, right? So it would not have been appropriate and still today isn't in some respects to have a very strong female body. Um, it is meant to be delighting in transient pleasures, that is pleasures that are short lasting, ready, silly novels, right? So the idea is that if women were to read at all, it should be something silly and frivolous, probably about some, you know, idealized romantic affair, right? So we have these ideas about uh, romance novels being less um, like a lower form of literature, right, than something else that perhaps a man would read. We see feminine virtues as caring only about vanity and attracting a man, right? And this is something that women still battle with today, right? The idea that women are meant to have, um, you know, we're expected to present ourselves in, in a pleasing manner, much more so than men are expected to. And this uh, manifests in lots of different harmful ways, not just in forms of body dysmorphia and eating disorders and things like this, but there was a horrifying statistic I learned, which is that women in the United States spend enough money on makeup in one year as it would cost one year of tuition, which means that you know, in a time where people are burying themselves in student debt, the amount of money we spend on beauty products could finance our education. But the reason we don't do that is because we have normalized, right, and celebrated the purchasing of these products and downgraded, right, the significance of saving for college, right, or the expectation that we should be able to get that money from some or other source. And then another sort of criticism, which is again, still prevalent today, is the idea that women prefer Lotharios. That is an outdated term for sort of a, I don't know what you'd call it, like a, a man who gets around a lot, right? So a sexually promiscuous man over a man of character. And so something you might be familiar with today, if you want a common con uh, conception of this, is the incel movement or the, the idea of individuals who are involuntarily celibate. This is a movement that emerged online and has uh, been a very hostile and misogynistic space um, and has actually been the root of a lot of the mass shootings and violence that has occurred against women. And this, the notions are connected here because the, the grievance on the part of these incel members is that, you know, women are just not smart enough to be attracted to them, right? That they're such gentlemen, but instead, you know, these women are giving their sexual attention to jocks or, you know, some uh, quote unquote alpha male that's, you know, maybe doesn't have the character that goes along with their looks. And so again, right, the idea is that historically these ideas have been promoted, right? It's been encouraged that women pursue perhaps men that are sexually unavailable, right? But then they get criticized for it. And so what happens is that this makes women not actually appealing to others, but just artificially so, right? You are just presenting this sort of facade through these, you know, getting involved in hobbies and things that you're supposed to be involved in, worrying about how you look, and that all of these things get in the way of women's ability to actually focus on developing their character. Right? And so these quote unquote feminine virtues, according to Wollstonecraft, are not really virtues at all. Right? And so what sort of education do, do women get at this time? Well, they're taught to arouse pleasure as objects and be completely innocent, which is sort of ironic, right? So you're supposed to be innocent, sort of this, you know, virgin on one hand, but you're meant to be sexually arousing to men on the other. But then if you get the attention of men, watch out, right? That's going to be your fault. Similarly, the innocence that they're supposed to adopt is that of something we might find in a child, right? But of course, we shouldn't want adults to have the minds of children, right? Because that is not only a weakness, but dangerous, right? If you're not, if you don't change your beliefs at all between when you're in a child and when you're an adult. 
Whereas men, on the other hand, have been taught to seek ambition, right? To seek higher offices, to go above and beyond their current status. And she thinks that this enlarges the soul. It makes you a better person. And the re so the result is that men teach or instruct women to be ignorant, but then criticize them for it, right? So women are thus treated as if they have no soul, but in philosophy, ironically, this notion of a soul really means our mind, right? So they're not building their character, not, they're not building their intellect, because it's the soul or the mind which allows us to acquire virtue. So in this sense, again, the soul is not the traditional religious notion, right? But the idea that it's something about your personal character that you have to develop. And we aren't giving women the tools that they need and then treating them as if they don't have the, the soul or the mind as a result. And so she says, if there is a God, right, then all women have souls in the more religious sense. And if women have souls, then they should be able and allowed to cultivate a virtue or education. But so we are treating them as if they don't have them. And then we're constructing a situation in which they're not able to develop one. Right, so here she advocates for education reform, right, in the private sphere, right, she wants academia to become, right, more welcoming to women, but in the public, she wants to see a sentiment, right, in the idea that people need to be willing to allow women to occupy positions of knowledge and authority. And both, she thinks, need to change for women's position to improve. All right. So there are a number of uh, claims made by the various individuals that she's targeting. I'll let you read over these to understand how she addresses each of these positions. So from Rousseau, right, he makes what were the very common claims at the time, and still some people make this claim today, that men are more virtu are virtuous enough for women, right, so that women don't have to cultivate virtue because men will do enough for them and women just have to rely on them or that women's education should again only and teach them to be pleasing. This again, unfortunately, is not an old or outdated view. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, the recently departed uh, Phyllis Shafley. She um, advocated that women should only go to school, to college, to attract a man who was educated enough to provide and support for her, and that if women did attract a man, you better make sure that you don't make more money than him as so as not to emasculate him. So just to let you know, these views are not so outdated. Again, right from Dr. Gregory, that women's education should teach them to cultivate a fondness for dress since he thinks it's natural, although that's kind of an oxymoron, right? Because if it's natural, you shouldn't have to teach them and that education should teach women to suppress her feelings since expressing them would be immodest. So we're going to see a lot of criticism here about the fact that women are supposedly more emotional than men. Right, and so then we have some other arguments that she makes, right, about virtue not depending on your nature or biological sex, right, but something that you cultivate through education. She's going to make some arguments for that. And as a result, even though she does ascribe to a heterosexual conception of marriage, she is going to advocate for marriage being more of a friendship, right? That if a wife is only taught to be beautiful, well, once they're married, they're going to take out their lack of purpose on their husband and children, right? Because after they're beautiful and married, who is their beauty for, right? And so the idea is that you construct a situation and women be where women become useless and might take out their frustrations on those very people that they're supposed to support. And so she thinks an ideal marriage would value respect across parties more so than dependence of women on their spouses. This leads us to John Stuart Mill, a British philosopher, political economist, and civil servant who is considered to be one of the most influential libertarian thinkers and is someone very prominent that you would come across social and political theory as well as in ethics. And so this uh, reading that you have is from The Subjection of Woman, where he defends women's full political and legal equality, right? He argues that there are, is no rational justification for unequal rights, that it purely rests on custom and tradition alone, and 
very progressively of him, he argues that any differences that exist between men and women are constructed, right? So this is a pretty radical idea at the time that the differences between men and women are not based on biological differences, but based upon a socially constructed idea of what it means to be a man or a woman, like we were talking about before, and as thus are not generalizable to each, right? You can't say that all men are alike or that all women are alike. So his targets in this paper are the what were at the time European norms for the status of men and women, and his thesis is going to be that rational argument dictates the social inequality in which one group of people, in this case men, dominate another group, in this case women, should be replaced with perfect equality. Right? So he's going to argue that inequality is wrong in and of itself, and that perfect equality would involve absolutely no privilege or subordination based on membership to a group. He acknowledges that this is very difficult to achieve, but that it is supported by reason, right? So the idea is if men are supposed to value rationality and argument and reason, then they should be convinced by his argument. And he thinks if someone is going to argue against him, that the burden of proof is on them, right? That you, the burden of proof is always gonna be on someone who's trying to restrict the liberty of others. And that this is only ever acceptable if it benefits the greater good. And this is in line with his um, ethical theory known as utilitarianism, which we'll encounter later in the quarter. But the idea here is that those claiming that women are inferior to men are actually restricting their liberties. And as such, those claiming the inferiority of women have the burden of proof. And if the burden cannot be met, then their claims should be rejected. And he's going to argue that the burden of proof cannot be met since it rests purely on public sentiment. In this case, by sentiment, he thinks that he's referring to customs, traditions, and feelings, that there is no actual rational argument for arguing that women are inferior to men. It is just a matter of past practice and what someone might feel. And he thinks, again, this has been assumed throughout history, much like Simone de Beauvoir is going to talk about, and that because patriarchy was viewed as suiting everyone, right, that is not the case if it ever was, right? So some people might argue, well, in the past it may have suited us to have a patriarchal system, we needed it. He's doubtful that that was ever true, but even if it were, he thinks it's not necessary today. And as I mentioned before, this is somewhat similar to the arguments that feminists are going to make with regards to eating animals, right? That maybe we needed to consume meat at one point in human evolution, but we've evolved past that, right? We have other, better, healthier forms of protein, right? So again, you can see the similarities there. All right. So one of the things that you're going to see a lot in these readings is an analogy between the oppression of women and slavery. And Simone de Beauvoir is going to elaborate on this a lot because they're not perfectly analogous, but it is important to understand when and where they are different and when and where they are similar. And in this case, he's going to be using the similarity here, right, where that anyone claiming that the present system is good for all is wildly speculating, right? They're just saying that probably because it's good for them, right? They don't actually have any empirical evidence, any reason, any rational justification to back it up, right? It's sort of like this idea like, oh, we just need to, you know, recapture what it was like in the 1950s, right? And get back to that time. That was so great for everyone. Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't good for women. It wasn't good for people of color. It wasn't good for gay men. It wasn't good for a lot of people. Right? So the idea that the existing status quo is good for everyone, right, is not backed up by reason. Why is it not good? Well, according to Mill, this system of inequality, in this case patriarchy, is based on a law of force, right, where we have turned what is assumed to be physical superiority into legal superiority and is thus a form of tyranny which should be rejected. Right? And the reason that he thinks people are just wildly speculating that patriarchy or the existing systems are good is because they've never tried anything else, right? So how can you say that it's the best thing if you haven't even tried an alternative? Right, so he thinks, again, if we want to acknowledge some of the analogies and disanalogies with slavery, 
there was once a time, right, when slaves were composed of men and women. He says, today, only men have been freed again. Here we're obviously only talking about white men. And he thinks women, though, are still dependent upon and thus enslaved by men. Of course, this is not the type of enslavement, right, that we actually see with black individuals, right, but again, making an argument by analogy in the sense that their obedience comes only from a fear of punishment and that because of their lack of legal status, they have no means of uprising and this is the only reason they have to continue their existence, right, as being subordinated to men, to appease them. And I think this is an apt moment to bring up, you know, again, the fact that this is still largely the case. We're living in a time when um, we have a culture of victim blaming, right, or, you know, giving someone a, a hard time when they don't come forward with a claim about discrimination or oppression or abuse. And we have to acknowledge the psychological position that someone is in if they're being victimized, right? So oftentimes the most dangerous, or not oftentimes, all the time, the most dangerous time for someone who's being subordinated is when they do or threaten to leave their oppressor, right? And so this is the case with intimate partner and domestic violence, as well as in other arenas. Right, so there's a quote about how, you know, men's biggest fear is that women will laugh at them and women's biggest fear is that men will kill them, right? And so the idea here is that we're acting as if it's the person with less power who should leave and then we criticize them for staying and we need to understand all the mechanisms that are in place which make them staying seem like the safer and smarter decision, right? And often as the case with women, especially at this time, it's not just gonna be their own safety that they're concerned with, but also the safety of their children. So as he acknowledges, it's not surprising that the structure has continued. So here again, like any good philosopher, he's going to be responding to some views that differ from his own, where again, the common thread is going to be any time these other views appeal to quote unquote nature, they're really just applying to or appealing to custom or past practice, right? So for example, that systems of government are arbitrary in this discussion, right? And that what we're really just talking about are differences based on sex. He thinks that this is false because the same was said of slavery, right? That we at once one time thought that there were biological differences, which meant that black people were inferior to white people, right? This is pervasive in scientific studies, right? Um, nonsense about people of color having like smaller brains than white people, women having smaller brains than men, right? A lot of similarities here. But at his time, he was viewing these uh, racial changes, right? Changes in seeing people of color as less than. And so he thinks in the same way, we need to move past this idea that women are naturally less than. The second counter position again, is that men's dominance over women is not by rule of force, but women are volunteering or want to be in that position. But again, there is an evidence highly to the contrary, right? That if a woman is in a position where she claims she wants to be a subordination, it's because she sees herself as benefiting from that more so than her liberty. And there are significant, right, at this time, numbers of women who are starting to break against that status quo during the first wave of feminism. And so he also acknowledges that men want women's submission to be voluntary. They want to think that they're not forcing themselves on them. And we see again, the same thing happening in instances of sexual assault today, right? Where Predominantly men will assault victims who are predominantly women, and then they will act as if the women wanted that, right? Or that they enjoyed it in their minds, right? So the same idea is that the dominant group is satiated or satisfied or justified by the idea of thinking that other people being in a position of inferiority is something that they actually want. When honestly, who would ever want to be inferior to someone else. 
Okay, so then he gets into the notion of women's education, which is something we saw uh, earlier with Wollstonecraft, right? Highlighting the idea again that women have been taught to be attractive, to be dependent, and to really not acquire anything on her own except beauty, right? Anything else should be acquired through her husband. And so this idea of subjugation then he thinks of as a resignation of your will to someone else's, right? And so the idea is that women do this because they know that if they have a strong will, it will be unattractive to men. And again, this might seem like an outdated idea, but I've heard lots of uh, examples from students in the past about how there have been instances with their boyfriend or partner where they pretended not to know how to do something to make their partner feel better about themselves, right? So that idea of like playing dumb or letting someone, you know, continue with the illusion that they are smarter than you in some way. We'll get into this more with mansplaining as well, but the idea that sometimes people will put themselves in that position again, not because they want to, but because they see it as necessary to get some bigger benefit down the line, right? So it's natural only according to him insofar as it is just normalized, right? We've just been doing it for so long. And this comes from what he considers to be really primitive intuitions, right? Or institutions, those that, you know, existed a long time ago and we shouldn't, right, in the modern age, even at his time, want to be continuing old traditions, right? So just because something has been the case doesn't mean it ought to continue to be so. So restricting voting, right, he thinks deprives society of being served by competent women and does not save society from some incompetent men, right? So the idea is that we often, when we maintain these institutions, we have a lot of rational problems, right? In that there's going to be a lot of inconsistency, a lot of hypocrisy, where we have a different set of standards for one group than we do for another. And so he thinks that in a modern society, we should pride ourselves on rejecting outdated customs, right? By allowing individual choice, by prizing freedom and competition, right? If we really, you know, at this time, the notion of a free market was getting a lot of uh, headway. And so the idea is if we want that competition to create the greatest amount of good and innovation, well, then you should have the best competitors on the field. And you're trying to prohibit half of the population or more than half of the population from even having the chance to compete, right? And of course, we would definitely want in a modern society to be ending any forms of injustice that have existed before. So his conclusion here again is that we should be advocating for progress. We should not just be disqualifying women from performing certain functions simply because they are women, right? That being a woman is not in and of itself a disability. Again, if you think that idea is outdated, you can look at the fact that we do not have maternal and parental leave in this country. And to get any sort of leave, um, if you're a pregnant woman, you have to go on disability. It's the only way that you can get maternity leave if your employer does not provide it, right? So this is in and of itself, according to Mill, not a part of a modern institution. Progress means social improvements for all, and in this case, raising the social position of women, right? So this notion of the nature of women, he thinks, is not natural at all, but is in fact entirely artificial. And, right, one of the things that he thinks men have already admitted is that men know very little about women. It's part of that nonsense behind that book, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus that came out a long time ago, right? But the idea is that men are often very vocal about how women, uh, you know, are so mysterious to them and they can't figure them out. So you can't hold that position on the one hand, but then claim to know so much about the nature of women that you know that they're not capable of doing certain things. Okay, so all he thinks we do know about human nature is that it is extremely susceptible to external influences, right? That's what we know, is that our environment matters. And so because of that, even if we have observed biological sex differences, they can be overcome by practice, and they say nothing about one's capacity to reason. Okay, so whatever individuals can or cannot do, we shouldn't forbid them from doing it. Right? The idea of having a free market, a free competition, is that the market will select the best. 
So you're only keeping someone out of the race, potentially, if you feel threatened by them, right? And if marriage and motherhood are, as men claim, so natural to women, then it is unnecessary to withhold alternative occupations from them, right? So the idea that if women enter the political sphere or the public sphere, they won't want to be married, they won't want to be mothers, well, he thinks that's either not true, right, if it's in women's nature to want those things, or he says if it is true, right, if women don't wish to marry, then it's men who need to do a better job of making marriage more worth their while. All right, so I think I'm going to stop there um, before I'll pick up the next session on Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex.